Tony is with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Tony is going to tell us today some stories, some case studies of some growers who found problems with glyphosate resistant weeds on their farm and they acted early and really have managed those patches. So uh, I'll hand over to you now, Tony, and uh, we'll pause periodically for questions. Thank you, Peter. Good morning or afternoon, whether, wherever you may be, but uh, it's a pleasure to present this today. Um, I've, I've had um, a project recently which is soon to be wrapped up, funded by GRDC, and one of the milestones is to look at case studies, as Peter said, about glyphosate resistant weed species in the northern grain region. I'm based at Tamworth and I've been basically dealing with glyphosate resistant weeds since about 1999, so 17 years. And I've seen some um, radical changes in the industry and some uh, good ag aggressive management of some of the weeds, um, particularly of late. And that basically stems back to looking at um, patch management of weeds. Okay, so this is my introduction to what I first saw back about 17 years ago. It's a Liverpool Plains, a photo here is what you can see. It looks almost like a pasture, but it's a fallow paddock. It's actually, well, what you'll see there is a line of death, and it was actually a crop that was sown. Uh, of a winter cereal, of course, and they realised they had a lot of uh, ryegrass in there. And they knew, I think, at this stage, they had a lot of uh, glyphosate resistance issues, and they sprayed out the paddock, clearly with glyphosate, leaving the, the glyphosate resistant weeds. But it makes you wonder how bad, how long did they have this problem for to get to a state where it's essentially covering the, the, the entire paddock? Um, I, I dare say, looking at some of the expertise and the modellers that do work with um, population dynamics, that patch or that infestation may have been around for at least uh, at least 10 years as a small individual, like something like that, where you'll get a generally a good kill over an entire paddock, but you'll see the stray individual that will survive. Um, sometimes you get that clearly from um, the, the two options, misprays, shading or you'll get glyphosate resistance. Um, as a farmer, a grower or an advisor, you, you, the plants sometimes don't have a sign saying I'm glyphosate resistant or I'm a survivor due to escapes, uh, misspraying or whatever. You, you don't take a chance. If you're at this particular stage, uh, which is in the early stages of uh, colonisation of a, of a resistant individual, um, you don't take any chances. Um, you, you enact upon it very quickly. But going back to that first slide, glyphosate resistance issues weren't well known about. People might not have got their head around the, the issue of glyphosate resistance. It might have been a stigma to a farmer to admit to glyphosate resistance. And so people may not have enacted upon it very quickly. What I'm seeing in these days, uh, people know about it. The messages are getting out about glyphosate resistance. They're at least spotting their problem patches much earlier in our smaller stages. Okay, this is how I, I'm a bit of a mathematics nerd, but all the, some of these things are driven by mathematics and formulas a bit, and they're, they're rather quite predictive. Um, and I'm going to condense this into some pretty key factors. Um, the graph up on the top left hand side is one that was say developed from a researcher called David Thornby up in Queensland, um, Department of Prime Industries when he was there. Um, that was a, a model that suggests, a predictive model to suggest when glyphosate resistance starts to break out in your farm in your fallow paddock, assuming over a 15 or 20 year time frame, which is that bottom axis, that after continual use of glyphosate in a fallow, that you'll get after about 15 years a blowout. So they're about right about there where the, the pointer is. That's in continuous fallow. Continuous fallow, we did you know, glyphosate only applications, we know um, follow up treatment. Yep. You let those surviving plants set seed, however few they may be. But when you get to a certain point, it 
come, becomes pear-shaped and you might only have one or two individuals as per that previous slide. And you can see in this graph, only after about three or four years, it may or should start to develop and take over the, the, um, the paddock or all the individuals become resistant only after a four, five or six year period. The other, the other line there is just another tactic which delayed the onset of glyphosate resistance, so that might, might have bought you another five years. So clearly one factor is time. As I said before in that very first slide with the photo of ryegrass everywhere, um, time, time was a factor in activity. But importantly, depending on the species of weed, um, we have a spreading coefficient. So you've got some weeds have the propensity to, to spread, some that have slight partly wind blowing seed. Um, you've got harvesting operations, um, sowing, uh, cultivation, stock. Stock can, if, if grazed at the right time for the, the weed and they've got a few seed heads, um, some of that stock some of those seeds can be digested and, and um, dropped out somewhere further around the paddock or if it's a muddy, muddy day. So you only need one or two plants to move long distances and you'll start isolated patches somewhere else, which basically links in with farm hygiene. You can see the, the representation down below that graph. It's just an image of a paddock and the effect of the cultivation and the movement on um, say you've got a patch of weed somewhere, you, you drag it across the paddock um, and you may significantly move seed at least 20, 30, 40, 50 metres from your original infestation and that will assist in blowing that patch out. So then an NDVI image of green glyphosate resistant weeds? Or yeah. It is. Yeah. And uh, to exacerbate things on top of that, Pete, um, if you keep on doing the same old bad practices of the past is obviously the same old message we've been saying for years and years. If you keep on using the same old technique, glyphosate, 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 the weeds will thrive in that environment if they're glyphosate resistant. I think there's also another aspect which is apathy or a will to change. It's not just a, a scientific thing but the farmers are the ones making the, the decisions and the agronomists. And that's an important aspect in weed management is the sociological sort of factors, the social science about actually making decisions. Um, you've got seed production. You're know, going, um, these plants that we deal with, they only spread, uh, persist, spread by seed production. If they don't have any viable seeds produced, we stop them from selling seed. That's the end of the story. You know, they, they don't get to spread. Um, so that's the old adage of stop seed set, weed seed set. And if we don't have an option on an array of treatments that we can select from, our management tools that makes it rather difficult to, to control if we've only got one or two other viable options where if you had a whole handful, six or seven or eight, would be a lot more favourable. Now I'm one for adages and analogies and I sit around the car thinking, Think about this for. I think well, our, our farms need to have an immune system like our bodies. You now we get invasions from germs that come into our body every day, and our body automatically, automatically um, attacks any new invasions. And the same same that happens with with weeds. Um, if we have a really robust farm which can put up and deal with any new incursion of weed, we can um, enact that pretty quickly. So here's a, a nice representation of a, an immunity system of someone's body and you can imagine if our immunity system doesn't work, we'd have um, bacteria run through our whole body and just devastate the whole system, the same with weeds. And so we, we can um, substitute some of these things and we've got the immunity system in our body has various factors or various ways we can control diseases and, and infections, we can do the same on our farm. Like the use of pre-emergent herbicides is a good one because we, in the north, northern region, haven't used too many and we're trying to use those a bit more than, say, the standard post-emergent knockdown herbicides. We can burn patches if that suits, doesn't suit every um, 
options grazing with sheep and cattle for mixed farming enterprises, optical spray technology, quite handy in the northern fallow particularly, um, monitoring which is just detecting your problem early enough. Uh, cultivation can sometimes be used strategically. Um, hand chipping has been done on some of the case studies I've seen. Um, robotics is something that may be used in the future. So general farm hydrating, you know, cleaning equipment, don't run around your farm and spread seeds. Uh, uh, that one I can't quite see. Uh, we'll just have to see that one's probably non-crop weed control. There, we just had a little technical thing there. Um, we that really involves irrigation channels and slides around silos and buildings. So we don't give sometimes that enough attention in our overall farming system. And the last one is double knocking, which is a standard practice for particularly fellow systems in the north. So that's uh, that's my analogy, and we should we should treat our farm like our body and have a really strong immunity system. Um, really, this is just an overall summary of what researchers, and I've been trying to look for information about this. Um, we generally have a um, a lack of information of how to manage patchy weeds. It's it's not been formally put together in any any paper I've seen. Um, and one research up in the north has looked into patch management of crops like existing barnyard and grass. But at the moment, when I last heard these results, they were at an interim stage. But it needs to be done because we're all in the research community being basically obsessed with in paddock management of weeds on a broad acre scale system where we need to sometimes go a step earlier in the timeline and go back and look at the patches. Um, so what we do, we've got a lot of tools already out there, it's just how we formulate them and put them together. So we've got excellent options such as um, chemical, the, as I said, double knotting weed seeker and pre-emergent herbicides. Some of those may be applied to the whole paddock still, some of those can be patch specific like a weed seeker. But we've also got non-chemical options as I mentioned before, grazing, cultivation, and you can patch cultivate. Uh, burn, uh, hand chip or hoe plants. So the, the issue is I don't have a set recipe. Um, it's up to whoever is managing these weeds to decide what combination of those options will work for their specific circumstances. Okay, I'll give a brief introduction for those that are not familiar with the Northern Grain region. This is where we're doing our case studies. Uh, the Northern Grain region is defined by that Nice dark zone on the map of Australia. Goes from the Victorian border all the way up to the central Queensland. And it's a very diverse farming agroecological zone. The bottom part, which is winter dominant rainfall, and it's about 50-50 rainfall in this area. And as you go further north, you get more summer storms. So we have a wonderful range of species from summer and winter active. And we also are based, our system is based generally on a fallow based system where a lot of moisture is captured by the soil in rainfall events and we try to preserve that moisture for a crop. So in essence we've been using glyphosate in the, since about the mid to early 80s for at least 20 something years, getting up to 30 years in most cases and we've been putting our foot on the accelerator with our glyphosate use. And therefore, we've um, um, we've basically developed out of all the glyphosate resistant species on the register, the glyphosate resistant weeds in Australia, we have eight species out of the um, 12 listed there. And so we've got annual rye grass, barnyard grass, liver seed grass, flea bane, windmill grass, etc. South thistle. So northern region is the home of glyphosate resistance and exactly where the pointer is is the hot spot. Just near the point of New South Wales border is where we've got a lot of glyphosate resistant. And most of that is in the form of patches so far. It's not wide scale dominating the whole paddock here. So Tony, given these uh, these numbers in front of us here, mm -hmm. that should give us a pretty good indication of uh, the ability of the species to evolve glyphosate resistance, shouldn't it? Because 
you're saying it's been under enormous pressure and chemical fallow. We've got ryegrass there in the hundreds and then barnyard grass, third flea bane, fourth windmill grass. In your mind, do you sort of list them in roughly that order for species ability to evolve glyphosate resistance? Uh, yes, I'd say so. Some of those numbers are drastically underestimated by survey, um, mainly because we they surveys notoriously underestimate, and this hasn't. It all depends on which target species, but it's a good indication, particularly annual ryegrass. Um, it's a very diverse um, plant. It's got a lot of uh, outcrossing, a lot of variability. It's the world champion. It's a world champion of resistance, yes, and it shows there. Um, but, of, the uh, other, of the other northern species, do they, you know, do they sort of go in order like that, or are they all a bit more similar to one another? Do you think? Um, I think it's I think it's where they're placed in uh, the environment. Barnyard grass specifically does grow a fair bit in that, in that uh, northern environment near the Queensland border. And what I believe causes it to be a little bit higher than normal is that in that particular area. Um, Barnyard grass has a lot of factors. It germinates during the summer, the whole summer, autumn, spring period. So it has a big window of opportunity to emerge, more, more, more exposure to glyphosate. For example, liverseed grass might only have a compressed emergence pattern, so it doesn't get the selection pressure so much. And it's also about historical data. And in that northern area, which I highlighted near the Queensland border, that in the last 15, 20, 30 years, historically had more summer storms, more pressure on the glyphosate through the fallow, um, and that's where, why it's sort of, especially in the eastern part where the storms you know, dump their rain. So there's a lot of pressure on glyphosate. To get three or four applications in a fallow season is a fair bit of pressure. Mm. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's a good question, Pete. Thank you. Um, here we go. I love my analogies. You have to uh, endure this one again. It's analogy number two, and it's a game of snakes and ladders. And this is this is an issue. I can come here as an expert and give textbook theory, but things in the real world don't always go according to plan. And obviously, our goal with weed and patch management is to get to number square number hundred. And if we're if we, we got on uh, our problem early, we might already be halfway up the snakes and ladders game. If we start and we've been a bit apathetic or slow, we might be starting at square one. But anyway, we have issues that sometimes you do some really good things and you get on top of your weeds and some days maybe you don't get on top of your weeds and there's some of these things we can't control. Um, okay, so. The first thing that popped up in the bottom right was early detection. Now you'll, you'll get some points there. You'll go, you'll go up again with snakes and ladders. If you can get your weed patch to the point that it might be as big as your lounge room or something like that, a small area, you tick a few boxes. Um, the next one, IWM. So don't just use glyphosate. Use a whole range of options. You'll get some points. We'll go through them quickly. Farm hygiene. Issues that you've had you can be focusing solely on that patch, but outlier patches start occurring on other parts of your farm, you, you start to, um, to lose. But if you've got good farm hygiene, you, you get on top of things. Um, stop weed seeds, so that's probably the big critical. Always, I'll always harp on that, I'll always keep on using that message, stop weed seeds, so that probably gets you a long way up the game of snakes and ladders. Unfortunately, we have some things in life that maybe hold us back a bit. Um, we'll have a drought where you'll get weeds that germinate, but then they go to stress really quickly and they'll just sit there and they might not be prone to herbicides. Or you could put pre-emergent herbicides that doesn't rain, or you just get small amounts of rain. You'll get time constraints. Some other farmers are so uh, time poor with maybe one spray ring over 10,000 hectares that don't have time to spray their fence lines or spray their paddocks in time at the timely, timely manner. Uh, let's see what another one, floods, that's a good one. We get them up in the north and maybe this year's a good year for that. Um, a lot of weeds in particular have come into new areas due to floods and we'll go through that like case study. And continued use of glyphosate. And I, I have had one or two farmers that had glyphosate resistance 
and they still wanted to use glyphosate, but they could not get off it. And that's obviously clearly not going to be a good option. And the last one is just letting weed seed set. So it's, it goes hand in hand with the, the ladder and the snake there. If you stop weed seed set, um, you can go up the ladder. If you don't, you'll go down the snake. And I've seen some really good jobs. Farmers getting almost on top of their game, and then one year they have a blowout. They can't get on there, and they, they lose two or three years of hard work. So anyway, that's my last analogy. The last one. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, introduction. As I said, I'll go through some of this. I've said this before. All large infestations start as very small patches, one clan, two or three. Um, one, some of the questions that this raised that may go through your head is, what's the cost of doing these things? Do I, um, do I tap this? Is it going to incur a massive cost? Um, for me as an advisor and slash a researcher and other people, we have to find some champion farms out there that actually had real life experience. So can we find success stories out there? Uh, farmers that are um, going through the ropes and, and trying to battle these patches. So that's what I'm here for today. Um, what, what is success? You know, the, if you want complete genocide, that's great. You need to in, in, eliminate that weed species from your farm, that's great. But that, that's a very high level form of success. It might only be to contain the patch or to thin the patch or not let it spread over the whole farm. That still is success. What happens if we continue the farming system with glyphosate? Well, that's a bit obvious, but one or two farmers have said they they, um, they wouldn't have it any other way. They've um, kept their patches contained. And if they didn't do it, they'd have a, a catastrophe. Um, and there's other things like can we uh, look at all the other alternative strategies and you have to learn all these other techniques that are out there. And can we combine these together properly? So I've got a few photos there, feather top loads in a cotton crop, um, the top one, and that's classic case of intervention, immediate intervention straight away. Now I've got four case studies we'll go through today. Um, they're the four species. Top left is that ryegrass. Um, top right is liver seed grass. All fallow weeds, or they can be crop weeds as well, but we're mainly dealing in fallow. Bottom left is barnyard grass, and that one's in an irrigation channel, which is a bit disturbing once the seed can just go down a Waterway and feather top large bottom right, which is um, which is coming from the north, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, I do ask questions of the farmers to gauge their historical perspective, their background, their farm enterprise, what they do. Uh, you know, it's a mixed farm system and their rotations and etc. Uh, look at the history in terms of their uh, first experience knowing that the weed they're dealing with is glyphosate resistant um, and what they think caused it. And uh, then dealing with the problem, we look at the, what they've done post discovery of glyphosate resistance. So, what radical changes have they made to overhaul the, their problem? And then there's a section with about reflections, their deep and meaningful thoughts about what they could have done better, any issues they've had. And, and success stories as well. So it'll give it a bit of a balanced view. Okay, weed species number one, annual ryegrass. That's the one I dealt with. It's the biggest ticket item since it grows all over all the growing or grain belt regions of Australia. Um, there's some driving forces, some critical driving forces about this weed. Um, glyphosate resistance is widespread, but patchy generally. You can go to Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, um, New South Wales. Um, there's all cases of glyphosate resistance, so it's not unique to the northern region, really. Um, we've got issues that got more than likely, particularly in Western Australia, South Australia, if you've got glyphosate resistance, it will also have resistance to other modes of action, so your other chemical options are rather limited, so you can't just uh, run out with any other tin or herbicide. Um, for the northern region in particular, um, most of the infestations are confined generally to non-crop areas, generally. 
um, and some of these are particularly coming from road um, fence lines, roadsides or crop verges and unfortunately that's the, an option living adjacent to a crop it won't be long before um, they gradually move into the crop and the impact on cropping systems. Um, and clearly if they're growing in a fallow, they've got greater ability to produce seed. Best thing about the weed, I suppose, if you need to attack them, is there's a lot of evidence that um, suggests that the seed bank is short-lived and the emergence of seeds each year is in the order of 80 90 percent per annum. So after two or three years, you've got the seed bank down to extremely low levels. Um, it's a heavily researched weed, so we've got a lot of knowledge about alternative control tactics. And as yet, it's a lot of pre-emergent herbicides still work on annual rye grasses, a general rule. Um, case study number one, which was a property in the central west of New South Wales. It is a mixed farming enterprise, so they had about um, 5,000 hectares of cropping, 3,000 hectares of dual purpose crop slash pasture. They suspected glyphosate resistance in 2009. In the past, they had a heavy reliance on sorghum, three sorghum crops in a row, followed by wheat canola. And they've now reduced their reliance on the, that summer crop so much to insert a few more uh, winter crops, namely chickpea, barley, canola was already in there, and a dual purpose wheat. So that basically gave them more flexibility for using alternate modes of action chemistry in the winter phase when, they, when the, the rye grass was there. Uh, but the overall situation on this farm is that they've let the horse bolt a little bit. You've got 30 to 40 percent of paddocks have some form of glyphosate resistance and 10 percent were classed as beyond patches. So in this particular case study, maybe time was a little bit against them. And I obviously interviewed them um, not that long ago, so we're looking about six, seven years down the track. Um, they do use the alternatives to glyphosate and fallow, and they're using paraquat. But the photos here are not great. You see a lot of the senesced rye grass plants in there. They're rather large and maybe, and there's one down here which is reshooting. They're obviously using paracot, expecting it to be like a wonderful translocated herbicide to do the job. And that's what I've seen a lot. They just need re-educating with some of these herbicides. Um, they're using sheep, which can be good if they're used properly. Uh, they would be good as a second knock alternative to say something like this, to add more pressure to the first paracot knock. But they're used as patch manager, managers. Sheep can be good and put on heavy enough rate. I did talk to the farmer recently, the farm manager, and he's happy with this patch up in the top left here. He says there's only a few, you know, like a few straight plants, which is what you expect with the carryover seed bank. Um, they're not using pre-emergent herbicides in a fallow, which is an issue, but they can now, there are a lot of chemistries out there which they can use in their fallow, which will suit the subsequent crop, crop which they're, they're using. So that data's been given to them. Um, as I said, the issues with paraquat that they're learning. Um, they do resort to cultivation as a reset trigger. So if they do get a blowout, um, they use cultivation also to renovate their fallows for you know, leveling out their ground a bit. So it's a dual purpose tactic. Um, fortunately, being in the central west but not too far south, a lot of the other mode of action chemistries work. So they've got that in their hand. But on, on departure from their place, that bottom photo, here on the, on the left hand side, you can see that it is paracot, but the predominance of weed is very adjacent to a fence line, which suggests that the issue on the fence line is contributing to the empathic weed control burden. So they, need, they needed to step up there, and fortunately I had some information to give them to, to assist. Um, so yeah, they're reasonably happy that they can, the, the farm manager wants to take it one step further and get better weed control on this particular property. So at least in this particular case, maintaining their patches and making them a lot thinner. Um, to add to this, this is not a case study, this is beyond 
that case study. I, this is in my travels and it's relating to annual ryegrass. Is I was doing another case study of a particular property near Balata on barnyard grass and its glyphosate resistance profile. And the farmer said, hey, come out with me, Tony, have a look at this. I've got, I think I've got glyphosate resistant ryegrass. And he showed me um, this patch on a contour bank and that would in essence only be a quarter of a hectare if you're lucky and that there's a few dead weeds amongst that and he, and he asked me what should I do uh, and I just looked in amazement, you get onto it and do something, stop these things from setting seed. They set seed that could triple in size the following year um, and I don't think that's a complete answer over a whole hectare but he was just showing me that he can pull some out but you know it could have been um, a patch cultivation, it could have been a, a select herbicide application or if you had the time, yes, to pull each plant out. Whatever, whatever you do, I don't care what they do, stop the plants from setting seed. That's all, all it's about. Here's another one, um, then the ryegrass yet again. This is possibly more disturbing. Don't look at that sign, that may implicate a, a particular shy council in the northern New South Wales area but um, that's a roadside there, roadside bird, you've got a crop right beside it and they spray glyphosate on the roadside here. As you can see, the mottled effect of susceptible and resistant plants. And on top of that, they'll, they would have set seed and as you can imagine, they grade that occasionally. So they'll let them set seed and then they'll start spreading them with the grader. So there's a lot of need to get some of the councils on side because they do impact on adjacent farming property. And here's one at Narrow Mine, an irrigation channel, and there's zones of death there and there's ryegrass plants growing happily, um, clearly resistant, and there's irrigation channel there. So you can imagine if the seed fell off the plants and where they'd go. It's a good avenue of going straight into a paddock. And here's one, Liverpool plant yet again. And it's ryegrass in a wheat crop. I don't see this too often where the ryegrass is shooting over a winter cereal. And the options would be, in this particular case, either, well, I would take a drastic action and, and bale that or cut that out. You wouldn't spray glyphosate, but you'd, you'd do zone or management, cut that crop out. You lose a bit of yield in that little patch, but I'm sure in the long run it, it would be economically viable to surgically remove that by taking a part of the crop. Even if it impacts on 5% of the paddock, it, it's probably well worth doing. Okay. Right, so just, uh, I'll just interject for a minute. Get your questions coming in, everyone. We haven't had any questions yet. And uh, Tony, I'll give you a bit of a hurry up. We've got about 15 minutes to go. We've got three case studies. So no problem. Yeah, we'll keep, keep rolling. Okay. Never see grass. This one's a quick and easy one. Uh, the beauty of this one is, uh, the weed in terms of its ecology, um, these are summer weeds now, we're talking the summer weeds. It's got of moderate longevity, the seed bank doesn't decline as fast as ryegrass, but the, the growth rate in summer is amazing. These plants can put, possibly put on a leaf every second or third day. Um, it moisture stresses quickly, so that's one thing we have to be aware of. Um, but as I said previously, narrow wind, window of emergence. So it tends to have a compressed emergence pattern in the October, November period, depending on rainfall. Um, and it's not a really widespread weed in the overall scheme of things in the northern region. But we have had resistance. The case study we're looking at is a smaller property, 600 hectare, it's all cropping. The bloke had suspected glyphosate resistance in 2006 and 7, so basically 10 years ago. I did actually case study this guy in about 2011 and by the time I got there, his one hectare patch which is down on this map here which is a little red dot near the gate is one hectare in size, right near the front gate, there it is. And so in a way that's good news if you get that early detection. Um, he had a lot of diverse rotations because being up near Moree, we can do summer and winter cropping a fair bit, like the last case study was fortunate. So he can do a summer crop, he can go long on fallow, chickpea barley. He's got all the arsenal there to long terms of crop rotation. One winter he uh, used one winter cereal crop and he brown manured that. Now he, he 
wouldn't think that would have any impact on our summer growing weed, but he used that as a mulch effect. Very high yielding crop, a lot of biomass, and that was laid down and put down as a mulch effect. 2009, he threw the kitchen sink at it. I wish I had a photo of a kitchen sink on the crop or on a fallow, but he did. Um, you can do that when you've only got a small patch, a one hectare patch. He's used chemical and non-chemical options, tactics to the patch. And in one year, he used frequent cultivation. He realised his cultivation initially wasn't that good. He didn't use wide sweeps. And he noticed a certain proportion of plants surviving, which is, in essence, almost fruitless. So he reverted to full disturbance cultivation. Um, clearly, for one hectare, it's not too hard, especially on your front gate to go and monitor that patch. Um, he did use double knocking in one or two of the years. He used pre-emergent herbicides, namely flame. Um, and his classic line, well, pretty knock around blokes, said, just get onto it. So he didn't have any issues about jumping onto an issue, just jump onto it and get into it. Um, he's not quite saying he's got eradication, even though he'd be flat out seeing the plant, because he's aware that you know, glyphosate resistance could pop up anywhere on his farm. Just to, you know, everyone, he still uses glyphosate, of course, so he's always on the lookout. Anyway, he's made changes to non-affected areas of his farm, so he has altered some of his farming regime or practices to minimise the chances of getting glyphosate resistance. And that photo there is the front paddock, but that's a winter crop, but that's where the, the um, liver seed grass was. Ornest barnyard grass is one of the, well, I'd call it the, probably the biggest summer fallow issue. Um, there are one or two others, but it is the biggest summer fallow grass species in the northern region. Um, the problem is it's got a like liver seed grass, it's got a moderate size seed, so the seed bank doesn't deplete so fast, it seems to decline a little bit slower, looking at a three to five year time frame to dwindle that seed bank down. Yet again, it grows very fast, it can moisture stress, um, it has fantastic seed production. You can see the plant down the bottom here, which may have 60, 70 tillers, and each panicle has at least 50 seeds. You can multiply that out, one plant can produce huge amounts of seed. Um, it has a long period of emergence, and I've seen I've seen the plant emerge in March, just as it's going down into autumn. Um, the biggest the biggest issue I see in the north, and this is like going down a big bowl constrictor down on that snakes and ladders game, is if as soon as you grow a soil and crop and you don't get good pre-emergence control, um, you're sort of stuck trying to kill a grass in a grass crop in a post-emergent sense, and that's where you, know, you need three, one plant per even you know, 100 square metres, and if that produces a lot of seed, you, you go down that long state. But it's susceptible to a lot of other modes of action chemistry out there, which is you know, it's relative Achilles heel. So this, pro this property, the case study I've done, was out in the Western Downs in Queensland. Um, it's a mixed farming property. Uh, relatively large, over 2,200 hectares. They had glyphosate resistance confirmed twice. Um, they have a lot of, uh, well, wheat, wheat is winter cropping. They have three consecutive crops of wheat and then a long fallow to absorb them, and then another long fallow. They understand that their long fallows give them opportunity to cultivate, particularly on their blowouts, which occur. Um, but now they're starting to, and they regret not using the pre-emergent chemistries in their fallow a lot more um, in the past. That, that's what's led to their problem. One thing that they've noted, which sometimes is an issue, they've gone out and tried to spot spray on this large property where the resistance has sort of got away a little bit, their patches are moderate. Uh, they've gone through and tried to spot spray and they've found that counterproductive because they don't see the outlying small plants. They don't get back there in another couple of months. Those plants have set seed and started other little patches. So in that particular way, it's, I think, very time inefficient because um, they've they just got too much to do. Um, they do use a weed seeker, so optical spray technology, whichever one suits any farm. 
Um, it just saves a lot of time. You can go over the ground in rapid time relative to hand spot spraying. But you're still putting glyphosate in that wheat seeker. Well, that's an issue. That's the, they've done one good thing, Pete, as you said, but they've gone down a they've gone up a ladder, but gone down a snow. Yeah. So in that particular case, they use higher rates, and in essence, sometimes that may work, but I wouldn't recommend it. Clearly, there's other alternatives out there, which um, apart from glyphosate, uh, um, they've also got issues with other species. So sometimes we look at these weeds um, by themselves, and you, you think. Oh, they've only got that species, but they're battling with other weeds and they've got down the top roads. Um, but they're finding that's not a big problem. We'll talk about down the top roads next. Um, and they're basically basically saying what I've just said. They're, they're likely blowouts occur to into the emergence and so on. And that photo down the bottom, bottom left, is what do you do there? You could interrow cultivate, but you've got soil them growing, and there's plants that go growing that in intra row area, intra row area, sorry, which are hard to get to and they will still set seed and you know, be a burden for in the next three or four years. Anyway, they're still quite happy with the job they've done because if they did nothing, they'd say their whole place would be riddled with weeds. So they, they still say success, but they're, they're nowhere near eradication, but they're still getting they're still still in front. They did use sheep as well, I missed that point, but they did use a uh, sheep. Here's a few Interesting images of some of the other places I've gone to. This is not of this case study, but this is this is where you sometimes see it on road edges. So it's not not crop, but the crop's only about three to four metres to the left of that. But you'll see barnyard grass growing up on road edges. That's general hygiene. This is a farm uh, which had glyphosate resistant ryegrass, and the resistance was around a chicane, a paddock or two back behind that tree. And you'll see just a little outbreak here. It makes you wonder how that came there. Barnyard grass. Barnyard grass. Yeah. And you'd think that most farmers, maybe in a rush, got mud all over their car with a few seeds stuck to the car, hooning around that corner, <laughs> hooning hard, and a bit of mud flips off. Bang I'm just that's my interpretation. But why did that why did that patch just pop up there? Um, makes you wonder that um, yeah. Agricultural vehicles of any description are a good source of weed seed spread. And this is the same property in the centre headland. You can see the, the tyre tracking and there's a patch there where a lot of, lot of uh, transport. So not let alone just going there starting a patch, but then that patch can then start other patches if it's in a high trafficable area that will have seed and then you can start spreading it all and sundry all over your place, wherever you, the seed decides to drop off. And this is the same farm. Um, you can see he has sprayed paraquat. Um, you can see the burnt off plants. He did spray paraquat a little bit too late, some are re-tilling and re-shooting. And in this particular time, it's getting late in the season. I know this was February, March. Um, he just reset it by. In preparation for something, he just cultivated. He didn't do the whole lot. I think he was going to do that later. But that, makes a good photo that is on a second knock and just taken out the survivors. Last species is Feathertop Roads. This case study was at Dolby in the eastern bounds, just west of Toowoomba. And Arnold and was quite good uh, about this because he knew about Feathertop Roads even before he had it due to the advisory information out there. And then they had the 2011 floods, so um, he was onto it. Um, basic factors before we get into the case study, it has a moderate amount of windblown seed, most of it still lands near the plant. Um, a lot of it is along roadsides, we see that quite commonly where most of the states. Um, it has rapid growth rates. It's faster than all the other grass species, it gets up and taller than, um, than even the barnyard grasses and it's yet again difficult, difficult to control in these summer grain cereal crops. Um, but the best driving Achilles heel factor about this word is this one here. The seed bank is extremely short lived. If you can bury the seed or put a pre emergent herbicide down on, knock out the plants in one year and stop them sending seed, there's next to nothing that survives the following season. Um, so it's a real sucker for cultivation. It really is a sucker. So, as I said here, the seed dies under burial. 
They say the case study, as I said before, it started in the 2011 floods. Um, he knew glyphosate doesn't work. Um, it wasn't officially confirmed, but a lot of the he has used it and it does not work. Um, it only got put on the register recently. He's changed his rotation from three sorghum crops, a chickpea and a long fallow, to reducing his reliance on sorghum, because that's an Achilles heel uh, for the, the uh, cropping system. So he reduced reliance. He put in some things like barley and mung beans, which gave him some alternative modes of action chemistry in summer. His biggest patch was only five hectares. So that's something. That's, that's not huge. Um, relative to those last two case studies where their patches are uh, in the first and the third case studies where that was a that was commonplace and, and there was lots more. Um, he's using more pre-emergent herbicides, but he, this guy does a lot of patch management specific treatments. Think of patches he treats with verdict followed by paracot, which is a permit out there to use in a fellow, so that's a double knock. So he just goes over with a, a small boom and, and, and treats those specifically. Um, he delays his summer crops to get a hit on the first flush of weed, so he's cleaning the paddocks, he will sow at appropriate times and delays his summer so he can get a, an effective knockdown. He gets out and hand chips his weeds, you know, this guy puts more emphasis on time with his weed control so he can get on top. And his fence line weed control, you can see in this picture here, that's the worst part I've seen in his whole crop, he's generally cleaned just about seven or eight plants there. And he's also used fire, which is down at the bottom. This is not actually him burning, but that's a Queensland Department of QDAF picture of Michael Witterick doing um, studies on burning patches of federal top roads. And that can come in handy, killing seeds and whatnot, particularly old, older senes plants. Anyway, in summary, this farm is quite happy. His five hectare patches now are isolated plants due to sacrificing a part of his crop, you know, like chickpea crop. So he just took the chickpea crop out and sacrificed that. Um, he claimed success, but this guy was really driven by developing a, like a plan. He does a lot of monitoring. Um, he's determined. So there's some psychological factors at play. Uh, I'll just wrap up a few finishing photos of my um, my tr travels around the Eastern Downs. Um, here's you've got feather top roads growing on the crop verges here. And this particular farmer has just done a sweep around the edge of the, the crop, or the fallow, I should say, uh, maybe to kill the isolated from the top rows. They don't do it for fire breaks in the north, we don't have that, but he's just done a sweep around and kill the, the stray fallow top rows grass plants. There's fallow top rows grass growing in irrigation channels up there, just like the other photo with farmyard grass. It's disturbing, nothing was done there. We've got fellow top roads in the eastern downs again, and they've obviously put a high rate of either uh, glyphosate there to stop the seed set. You can see the effect. And in this particular case, they've slashed. If done at the right time, it's good. Um, if done a bit too late when the seeds are mature, you can end up spreading the plant. There's one, one stray plant there, but you can see the, the biomass in making some attempt to stop seed set. Uh, and here's just a few others. That's federal top roads and a sorghum crop and impact on yield. That's what would happen if that got over the whole paddock. You can imagine impact on yield would be like halving or getting rid of three quarters of your yield potential. Yeah, so in conclusion, um, as I said before, no set recipe. I don't put out a recipe. We've got all these tools out there. Um, getting early onto your weeds. There's a whole range of pre-emergent herbicides are out there, there's optical spray technology, uh, hygiene and non-crop management of the weeds is essential as well. Um, but you have to be committed to go the distance with these, these weeds. It might be a five or ten year battle. It might, might always be a battle to go over your farm and check for weed patches and whatnot. Um, future, this is just a few slides just on the future. We've got robotics out there in a preliminary state. This one's an agbot that's uh, developed by Queensland University of Technology. Um, and it, it'll go over the ground, more for horticultural use at the moment. It can go over the ground and detect weeds and um, tip them up. Uh, and
and here's another one which is a similar style of theory where they patch cultivate a word, um, but this one's got a, a retractable time and it can go down. It's not at, it's only at the early developmental stages, but eventually it may be linked to a detector unit and it can detect the weed and um, push the time down into the soil for a small period of time and chip the weeds out and then retract that. So maybe in the future we'll have devices like this. Okay, and also just quickly, I've done and this work at play where people are looking at fence line, better fence line management weed control options such as uh, residual herbicides to give, give our paddocks or fence lines quite a good clean finish like product A there. Um, product B here, rye grass at narrow mine, whereas glyphosate and clethodim don't work. And finally, this one's at Ningen with windmill grass, and you've got some treatments there that can show some good potential. So I think I'll finish up on that one. Pete? Good on you, Tony. Yeah, there's some good case studies there, and very interesting now, everybody listening in. You've heard a lot of info there. You get some questions coming in now if you have a question. For me, what I've heard a lot of what you said is in that part of the world, obviously huge reliance on glyphosate, dry, you know, chemical fallows driven a lot of that. The thing I saw in your presentation is that these glyphosate resistant words jump out and stare you in the face, don't they? It's not like, I mean, that's, you would find them in crop, but obviously in those chemical fallow situations and sometimes in crop, you have these massive big weeds staring you in the face. So there is that opportunity to see them and manage the patches, which is a little bit different to southern Australia because often our weeds are hidden in the crop until we have a massive problem, whereas you guys potentially, am I right? Am I right in, in suggesting that there is a really, you know, obviously that's what your presentation has been about, but mm -hmm. there's a bigger opportunity in that part of the world to jump on these patches because they stare you in the face. Yes, yeah, you're right, Pete. I've always said that we have the advantage. I used to say strike while the iron's hot and that time is a fallow. But you're right, you can see your patch a good distance away. Once your crops are up and away and you get late emergent dry grass and it's a glyphosate resistance and say so um, you, you don't have uh, you don't have the best confidence in spotting every plant, but in a in a northern fallow, uh, it's it's it makes life easy, and you can resort to wide sweep cultivations if things get ugly. You can't do that unless you want to sacrifice all your crop in the west or south. Um, it makes life easier, and and the only the only issue against it is that they grow very large very quickly. But that's when you have to get make time your issue and get onto it as fast as you can. Um, I have fielded questions where people ask me, I've got barnyard grass and they're as big as my kitchen table and sometimes they do. Um, not necessarily due to their own fault, but as I said, it could be a flood which delays getting onto on their land for two or three weeks and the plants were already a decent size now, they're three times as big. But we still got the options there to um, do almost whatever we feel like on, on a fallow to get the upper hand. Um, and, but it doesn't say in the northern region there are also cases where we have to deal with these weeds in the crop. We have to occasionally not rely on a fallow all the time. We have to rotate our crop and we will get some of these weeds permeating in crops and we have to deal with them at that particular time. And that's sometimes where the weak link is. So another question, what do you see in the attitudes of the growers? Obviously, um, they get to a point where they go, well, I've got a big problem here. I've got to jump on this and do something about it. I know there's a range of people. Some people, it's when they see the first few weeds. Other people, when you've got a massive patch. But what's the general sequence of events in that part of the world? How big a problem are people getting into before they jump out on it and do something about it? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a really good question. I always thought about that. Um, I, look, I, I just go from what I've been seeing and the phone calls I receive. And in the early days, as I said, way back about 17 years ago, I would say that they kept things a bit hush and uh, it's a combination. One is yes, they don't want to know they've got resistance and they don't want to admit to it, 
But secondly, even if they do know, they have to have backup and control measures and a list of options available. If they're not really confident with the alternative options, they, they, they don't jump into the control techniques as well. But as time goes on, Pete, they, they're more aware, they're socially awareness of how they have a lot of system bleeds. It's more, almost more common than not. Than not. Um, so a lot of people are dealing with it. So they're accepting and also there's moderate knowledge to good knowledge out there that they know there's alternative options out there to control. So I see that they're controlling their patches no more than um, what people are finding it at first. Yeah, no more than sort of around about a hectare or smaller, but in the past it would have been over half a paddock. That moment, barnyard grass at Balata, which I didn't use as a case study here, um, that covered that covered the three quarters of the paddock, and that was a, a 500 hectare paddock, and then that it had spread to other parts of other paddocks on the property. So, so the awareness is a bit better now. People are jumping a bit earlier than well, they used to. Definitely, yeah. it is. I don't know what size, but um, there's no way we have data to prove or disprove anything else. It's just anecdotal evidence at the moment. So yeah, that, which is good. It's it's the services are out there for herbicide resistance testing. They can put their samples in if they suspect things. It's the whole package, Pete. All right, we've got a question come in. What uh, herbicide chemistry options do we have uh, for pre-emergent herbicides in fallow? So which pre-ems are you using in fallow? Well, at the moment, there's uh, there are herbicides such in the northern fallow. That obviously, they use Flame is one of the ones that have been around for a long time, since the early mid-90s, which, yeah, which the active is in Mazakit, which is a group B, in the Dazolinone. Now, that's not always a flavour of the month due to whatever cotton system you've got, because it has some plant back periods of 36 months to certain crops. But if there are push, pushes and drivers to get a lot of any tolerant crops out there, but you can go into wheat. There is an option if you even grow in conventional style crops, you could push in a crop uh, of wheat or whatever and the plant back some of short, moderate sort of duration. So you, you can use that herbicide. There's other ones like um, Balance, which is used, excellent for weeds such as fleet bane and south thistle. Um, yet again, this relatively small plant back for certain cereal crops. And there's also a lot of work underway with um, chemical companies because they see that as a, a market to replace glyphosate. So a lot of chemical companies are investing money into you know, pre-emergent or early post lockdown and pre-emergent control some of these summer weeds or winter weeds and fallows. Um, there are other herbicide options out there. I can go through a whole list. There's some of the triazines such as atrazine can be used and they've all got some level of control. I'll have to warn you that pre-emergence chemistries rarely give you 100% control, but they'll get you 80, 90, 95% control. That's what you do with the following survivors and yeah, seeds that control. Yeah, and so from what I saw, you had a lot of susceptibility to a lot of herbicides. So we've got this glyphosate resistance issue, but in a lot of cases, there's a range of other herbicide options. And so I guess part of it's breaking those old habits and <laughs> reaching for a different drum, mate. Hey? Yes, and, and up in the north at least, and hopefully everywhere, that they're re-educating a lot of the people. But up particularly in the north, their knowledge, background knowledge on pre-emergent curbsides or residuals is average and it can be definitely improved. So they're, they're doing some education campaigns of getting their knowledge base up on some of these pre-emergent herbicides because not they all don't act the same. You know, it's probably six or seven modes of action, different herbicide groups that have pre-emergent activity and people have to know about them because they all act differently. Perhaps a future Weed Smart webinar. Exactly. That's a good segue. <laughs> it is. All right. We're out of time. Thanks, everyone, for listening in and thanks, Tony, for your time.